welcome to our monthly mornings with O'Keefe. My name is Molly and I'm the adult programs manager here at the George O'Keefe Museum. I'd like to begin by recognizing the lands of the Pueblo people on which the sites of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum stand. We recognize and honor their elders, past and present, and celebrate the vitality of their people today and into future generations. I offer this with humility and gratitude in acknowledgement of the need to confront the ongoing injustices of settler colonialism. I'd also like to extend a thank you to our members and donors who are here today. Your support made this event possible. If you're not yet a member and you enjoy this program, please consider joining today. Visit gokm.org slash membership to learn more. Throughout this talk, please place your questions in the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on your device. We'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the conversation. For the duration of the lecture, the chat has been disabled. Please note that following today's talk, a recording will be made available on the O'Keeffe Museum's website in a week or two. Captions in both English and Spanish will be available. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter for the morning. We are so pleased and grateful to welcome Liz Neely. Liz Neely is the Curator of Digital Experience at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, where she leads efforts to publish the art, historic home, and archives collections. She produced the digital publications Exhibiting O'Keefe, The Making of an American Modernist, and Josephine Halverson, as well as the short film Following Enchantment's Line, directed by Stephen J. Yazi, Diné Laguna Pueblo Anglo. So with that, we are so happy and excited to turn things over to Liz. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Molly. And hi, nice to... Um virtually not see everyone, but feel your presence here. So I'm going to um, get started by sharing my screen here. Molly, I hope that looks good. So great. Um, again, great, thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you for joining us to hear about exploring George O'Keeffe's art through data visualization. I'm going to start with an orientation to what data visualization is, because perhaps some of you are more or less familiar with that. Show some examples and some ways that um, I've thought about it over time, then kind of go behind the scenes at how and why we developed and published our first George O'Keefe interactive visualization. Um, so a little behind the scenes. Uh, for those of you that are wondering, yes, the background of this uh, first slide is AI, generative AI um, created, um, and that'll be another talk another time. If you want to see that, just let us know. Um, and um, I do also just want to start by saying hi, mom, and, um, and uh, diving in. So um, this is a project that I'm really excited about, so I'm so gr um, grateful to be able to talk about it here. All right, so as promised, I wanted to start with what are we even talking about here, because um, I think we all have a different view of this, or maybe you haven't heard of this term so much. And to kind of talk about what it is, I'm going to turn to someone who's been influential, influential to me, Edward R. Tufti. And I've got um, some of his books that um, I think he self-published his first book back in the mid 80s. And um, has these are very these are kind of books that really talk about information and the display of information. Got some of them right here. Um, so I always like to bring props to talks. Um, and so I'm going to turn to him. And what he has as a um, as a definition is that data graphics visually display measured quantities by means of combined use of points, lines, a coordinate system numbers, symbols, words, shading, and color. Now, before I lose you all, because that is kind of, I think describing data visualization and data graphics and infographics is actually um, like tying a shoe. It's harder to describe than it is to kind of show, um, which I guess makes sense because we wanna, it's the visual. <laughs> but one of the main reasons that we wanna go um, that like this is a really um, interesting area is that humans are really visual creatures. Um, a visual is processed 60,000 times faster than any text. And studies show that 65% of the population comprises visual learners. And so this really helps things um, 
you know, looking at data in these big quantities in a visual format actually makes them a little easier to read. So going back to that definition that might have been a mouthful is really thinking about I've um, this is a page from visual Expl um, explanations um, from Tufti's um, visual explanations. It might be a little hard for you to see, but um, you get the sense that it's a graph. Um, so we have these measure quantities, which in this case is um, um, measurement of height, which you can kind of see just by seeing the larger things in the graph and then date across the bottom. When we talk about coordinate systems, it's X, Y, but of course this could be also spatial. So it could be more than just X, Y. Those of you that are engineers might be familiar with this, but um, what we see of a coordinate is going this way of one bit of information and another way. So you can really plot things and this can get very creative. So um, one of the things that um, Tufti also says is that like one of the most effective ways to describe, explore, and summarize a set of numbers is to look at pictures of those numbers. And this kind of gives an example of that. In addition, what it can also do is it can be evidence to make a point. It can allow for investigatory, investigatory exploration, trend spotting, because you can look at large amounts of information over time and see patterns. So um, again, from Tufti, um, assessments of change, dynamics, and cause and effect are at the heart of thinking and explanation. To understand is to know what cause it, what cause provokes what effect, by what means, and by what rate. So those are kind of the things that we can get from um, data visualization. Now, of course, the sciences have amassed and looked at, they, they are very advanced in using, because there's such massive amounts of data, particularly in sciences, Although right now we have masses around of amounts of data in almost anything. We are the age of data and that kind of thing. But I kind of wanted to um, at least a hat tip, though I don't think um, this talk will not be really about huge scientific data sets or visualizations. Um, it is definitely something that's out there, but I want to make sure that like what I'll be focusing on is more kind of the storytelling and um, and um, with art and uh, but I want to acknowledge that this is out there and there are some really so when we look at weather patterns and things like this, what we see here is really a visualization visualization of data. This is predictive. It's looking at how things are going to go but we don't really think about it as a visualization. We think of it as this is the prediction of the weather pattern. Um, so uh, Mark, um, Mark U. Um, Sabaro, I hope I said his name correctly, um, is the lead of, da of data visualization um, at, science, at the scientific, scientific visualization studio at NASA. He's the lead. And I like this quote, the public is being flooded with new information. Visualization is perhaps the best way to make sense of this complexity and to appreciate the connectedness and beauty of our world. In this case, our natural world, but I think that this actually applies to other kinds of visualizations. One more hat tip to um, large scientific data. There are also these huge data sets out there, and this is a different kind of visualization where it's kind of showing um, different quantities of um, topics. And this is an open data set. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, definitely go and check out what's at um, NASA and the data portal. There can also be really creative interpretations of data visualization, which I think many of you are art lovers. And so this really speaks to you. It really speaks to me. This is um, a um, project that was turned into a book. I have it right here as well called Dear Data. It was published in, um, published in 2016 where designers and visual designers, Georgia Lupi was in Brooklyn and Stephanie Posevic was in London. And every week for a year, they each gave each other a topic and they would each take that topic, collect their own data around that topic, and then design a visualization around this. So it's both of them would approach this in different ways. It's really, it's really fun and they're very creative. So I'll show one example of this. Um, this is one that Georgia did on a week of indecision. And I know that this might be a little, um, this is the front of the postcard is this beautiful visualization. 
And then the back of the postcard um, for the whole um, year for both of their um, would say how to read it. So um, this was entitled, Shall I? How to Read It? Every element, those circles, represents a moment in the week where I was undecided about whether to do or not uh, do something. And then each one of those is that if it's an upward facing um, lollipop, um, that means it was solved almost completely or stopped thinking about it. If it's a downward facing kind of lollipop, it was po po postponed but solved within that week. And if it's a sideways lollipop, it's still open at the end of the week. And then each of these like lines or the dots talk about, well, what was the indecision about? Like, so there's topics and, and subjects around here. So what I wanted to really draw out of this is a couple things is that, first of all, it can be, you know, this is a coordinate system in a very different way. It has a very different um, legend, but you need a legend because you don't wouldn't know how to read this specifically. And um, that one of the other important parts about this is that data visualization is based on data. So indeed, um, before approaching this, um, each of the each of the designers needed to think about what data am I collecting so that it would be something that could be tracked. So, and that's something that we think about a lot here in terms of how we are um, measuring information about George O'Keefe's life is that we really need to think about if we're wanting to present it in a certain way, we need to be collecting that information in a consistent way. Beautiful, isn't it? And then we have um, now that you know now that we are really in this um, in an age where we all have devices and we all have um, you know interactive kind of graphics that can happen on our screens. I shouldn't say all; many of us have it. So um, excuse me for that. It's not always evenly um, distributed. But what digital has allowed is a more interactive and engaging form of um, data visualization so that we can interact with it, um, that we can explore, and it can be just even more multidimensional. So um, I wanted to pull out another form and use of data visualization and in the form of a story that can be called a data story. Um, I'm showing a screenshot of one here that actually has a data visualization, and this is um, interactive about a climb up El Capitan, which is a um, which is a really hard climbing route. And so this is a story about this. The New York Times has used data storytelling um, really quite effectively, and I really love to watch that the evolution through what they've done. But I've actually decided to um, dive more deeply into an example in the art world because of where we are. And this is called Patterns in the Life of Vincent Van Gogh from the award-winning information designer and data visualization specialist, Stefan Poulin. Poulin visualizes information about the artist's uh, art and life to illuminate patterns aiming for a deeper understanding of the famous artist. I really, I really like Poulin because he uses different types of graphics and interactive visualizations, allowing the reader to further explore their own interest and dive a bit deeper. Um, so let me show a little bit of this. The story, uh, again, one of the instructions that um, the designer gives us is to take your time, wait for the animation. Um, so we aren't taking our time here, but um, this will give you an idea and hopefully you can check it out later. So this kind of looked at the body of work that Van Gogh did moves it into a timeline. I can interactively relate with the timeline to see what those points are in the life of Van, um, of, um, Van Gogh. I can actually look at the work so I can get a closer look at what the work is on that timeline. So these are all kinds of really influential things in the data storytelling that we have along the side is what it's trying to tell us. Um, I'll just kind of look at this for a minute. This is really an area I would like to explore more with the telling the story of Georgia O'Keeffe, um, actually turning it into a data story. So you see these different kinds of graphs, all of these are interactive, um, seasonality, when he painted, when he created, what they look like, where he was, and then um, really getting into also the size
allowing me to explore what I want to. This is canvas size. So um, really an interesting area, data storytelling, where we can kind of take these visualizations, but also tell a story on the side. Um, this actually ends up by saying where, um, where the work ended up, which is always an interest in um, Georgia O'Keeffe work. I want to share an older project from the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam um, that won an Information is Beautiful Award in 2018 and is a really good example of collection objects, in this case, coins. Um, the designers ask if you remember playing with your pa parents' coins. The visualization gives you a chance, but this time with a lot more coins belonging to the biggest coin collection in the world, the Munzkabinet in Berlin. Every coin had its own history. It could even be Alexander the Great or Caesar held them in their hands. This interactive visualization provides the chance to explore these coins and sort them through different layouts and filters. And uh, again, one of the reasons behind this is that it's really hard to show a collection of coins because online they all look alike. How do you show trends? How do you show all of these things? So I'm going to show a little bit of this. You'll see some of the same kinds of things, but it's using the coins as part of the visualization. So again, much like the other one, you can look at the actual works, but then I can order and I can sort by different properties. This is by material. And then by country, so material by country. And I love how it actually puts these at, um, puts these the materiality in piles of coins. You can almost feel them, you can almost touch them. Um, you can see them in different ways, depending on what you're kind of trying to find out. Um, and of course, even look at each um, collection record here on the timeline. So really, really pretty beautiful. And I think that the key of this is really that you need to, what problem are you trying to solve? What's the difficulty that you're, um, that um, is in, in the information itself? Okay. And this is a very creative take on a visualization. Um, I'm actually going to play it. Um, oops. Went to the next one. Um, and part of it, I think I, I don't not necessarily understand everything because I can't read the language and don't know all the cultural references, but it's so beautiful. The um, This is from the called the Traditional Chinese Color Libraries Browser by Zihang Zhejiang University. The developers use the traditional Chinese image of swimming fish, which I'm actually not familiar with, um, to represent the color data and then selected the colors that are based that are best represent the three traditional Chinese aesthetic senses of nature, opulence, and poetry, namely seasonal colors, ancient painting colors, and poetry colors. Users can select the color value on the fish. So when I was clicking on here, you can see values coming up. I know that they're in um, Chinese, but um, you could, the letters so that this actually provides something that a designer can then cut and paste and use in their own designs, because these are kind of universal colors. Um, this provide this work is provide provides a design tool so that designers can learn what the traditionally tr uh, significant Chinese colors are. So I know this one's a little bit of an outlier, but it's so gorgeous. And I think it really does show the breadth of what data visualization can be, especially in art. So data visualization and Georgia O'Keeffe. So just transitioning a little bit here, as, um, as most of you probably um, already know, I so I work for the George O'Keeffe Museum. This is the George O'Keeffe Museum. And our aim is really to provide accurate information about George O'Keeffe to local and global audiences. This is one of our goals. And this is Georgia O'Keeffe. This is a Todd Webb, a Canyon de uh, Shea. Um, and um, so that's really one of the goals that I'm looking at. And as part of that, We've really, um, if you've heard me speak before, we've been working for years on pulling together information about George O'Keefe and publishing it. 
And one of the things that we are have been actively working on for the last few years and are really hit, hitting the um, acceleration right now is on a digital catalog resume of George O'Keefe's work. And some of you might not be familiar with the, firm, uh, with the um, term digital catalog resume or catalog resume. What a catalog resume is the full breadth of an artist's work with key information about that. George O'Keefe has, um, has a catalog resume in print that was published by the National Gallery of Art and um, George O'Keefe Foundation back in 1999. Um, but it's very large. I, I don't even have one in my office right now to hold up. Um, it's very heavy, so it's not very portable. Not many people have it because it's also um, quite expensive. Um, and it's a little bit out of date at this point because of um, uh, it was published in 1999. Now, much of it is still foundational and is what we go back to to learn everything. But now we're really working on um, putting that together in a digital format that anyone can access anytime from wherever they are if they have internet access. And I just wanted to hat tip right now, the project we're working on is um, funded by the IMLS. But a lot of the pre-work that's been done was from the Toma Foundation and um, from a digital humanities advancement grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So what the, all of this work has also prompted us to think about is, well, we don't want to just publish the catalog resume as it is. What does our provocation is with the complete set of George O'Keefe artwork digitized, how might we look at the artist's careers through different modes? And so that's what really prompted us looking at and experimenting with data visualization. And um, so that I don't have logos on every single page from here on out, this, uh, the data visualization, our, our um, funders and partners, our uh, technical partners, designers and developers who have done a ton of work with me and are awesome, uh, are designed for context. Our audience research was done by HG and Co, also excellent. And this speci specific project was funded by the Toma Foundation. And um, many more uh, teams at the O'Keefe worked on this. Uh, it takes a village to get all of this data together. Uh, the NEH Digital Humanities Advancement Grant really helped lay the foundation. So um, everyone that's chatted with us and re researchers, it's just really important for me to so thank everyone. So thank you all. So as we wanted to think about this um, and really dive into how do we think about the catalog resume in this different mode is we really started with, this is designed for context, um, HG and co and, um, and others is, um, is really like doing those uh, sketches. And the, some of these will look a little messy. I love uh, back of the envelope. I love na napkin sketches. So this is really what this is. So, um, and these were done by Design for Context. So um, this may be a little hard to read, but you get these sense for where these things start. So we were looking at art. How do you browse thumbnails across a timeline with period boundaries? This, is a, this here is a slider focus. So how could the slider look at different things? bars to look at different quantities. So that's one idea. How do we zoom in in areas? Do we want to zoom in on art? Do we want to zoom in on people? Do we want to zoom in on exhibitions? So this is looking at a timeline, but then up here, do we look at time with where you lived in New Mexico? That kind of thing. Um, so that was an idea, a sketch. Another sketch that you'll see more fully fleshed out is a heat map. So a heat map is when you look at time and um, quantities of that cluster up in time. So if you looked at a location, where were the flowers most often show up? Um, when did the abstractions um, show up? So that kind of looks at things in, um, in different quantities. So that was another sketch. I love this sketch. Um, hopefully we do this someday. This is the serodepidometer. So that you could spin a wheel, you could look at something, you could spin a wheel and get something random, like a randomizer on various attributes. So uh, I still have that on my list of things that we want to do. And finally, this last kind of sketchy sketch was this eyeball, which I also think is fun, um, where one could pick two different properties, much like in the coins, theme or media and see where the two crossed over in a Venn diagram um, with the overlapping part. 
So that was really at that beginning stage. And then um, the team really looked at, well, what are the ones, uh, if we are looking at a, um, if we are really focused on uh, first on a researcher and a curatorial audience, what might be the best way to start? And really the timeline is something that came up in a lot of um, discussions when we were having focus groups around the catalog resume. And so um, this was one of those first sketches that got fully functioned out, um, fully worked out. So having a bar that you worked up and down and you saw the thumbnails and that divided up into themes. Another idea was, well, do we want to see those over timelines? And even what if we animate that? So um, this was actually something that um, a lot of people had a hard time reading, but the, it was um, intriguing. The motion was intriguing to see, to um, zero in on what are the trends? How do these trends kind of play out? What can we learn from that? And this is a further um, look at that heat map. So um, looking at themes over time, and then the darker would mean, oh, there are more flower trees and leaves here. Um, there are fewer of them here. So kind of looking over time. Um, actually, this one ended up being a little bit harder for people to read. So uh, we, uh, when we actually went through the um, focus groups. So it was a little hard to, harder to see trends in this one. So I think it would need to be um, thought of a little differently if we went forward. So, and then a little spoiler, this one was the easiest one for um, people we talked to to read, probably because we aren't, who, who we are talking to and who we wanted to target this um, um, visualization to be useful for, were researchers and curators and educators and not necessarily people who were using a lot of data visualization. So with that, it was um, the bar chart was something that was very easy for someone. They didn't have to go back to like that postcard and read a lot of instructions of how to read this graph. It was very intuitive. So this really ended up being something that people found um, very um, uh, intuitive. And this is uh, the last prototype that we'll look at. We um, had a little drill down, so across the top time, but instead of themes being on a line, themes would be in a certain area where in larger groups so that we can drill down. Um, many of us really loved this, um, and I think that this will be a future um, visualization. It did, it spoke more to artists and artist educators than it did to art historians because art historians and um, researchers and curators were looking more for the dates and which, um, and more about what was happening when. Um, but this did speak to um, other um, audiences. So I, I hope that we get this in the future. And, you know, when you ask questions, you can let me know which ones you think are really exciting. So we took these worked out prototypes and we really, we had some focus groups and uh, really talked through what was working and what was not working and what did we learn. So from this audience research, and this was again led by HG and Co., we really learned that um, people wanted agency to choose their own paths of exploration. So um, some of those early visualizations I showed you um, in the presentation where they were just more infographics, they weren't interactive, that really wasn't of interest. Really everyone wanted to be able to explore their own paths and didn't really feel like it would be useful if they didn't have that ability. Most people that we talked to preferred, as I mentioned, the bar graph because of the familiar, familiarity, because it was intuitive, and it had those dates. So it really, for the uh, for most of the people that we talked to, that was really um, key to what they needed to see. One really key thing was that people that we talked to would only trust it if there were clearly defined categories. So trust was really important for people to want to use it and make it useful. And so what, we, what we'll see is actually we change some of the way that we use categories because themes is much more up for interpretation. Like who decided this was a flower? Who decided this? 
Whereas when we went to um, what I'll show you of more how um, the production technique is that that's more solid, like I, people knew what that was all about. So that was based on what we heard from our focus groups. Um, everyone found it more approachable with representations of artwork. Those thumbnails in there were super important, um, particularly since people aren't used to reading visualizations. So it was a lot of information on the screen and something about having that familiarity and really actually getting a sense for what was the preview of what you'd see was really important and key. And finally, everyone is excited to have easier access to the full catalog. And I think that this is really what we've heard in feedback since is being able to see everything in a digital format. And this also um, really makes us happy because this is um, this is where we're going with the digital catalog resume too. Um, so uh, we have um, from our website, this is, we ended up publishing a visualization and um, this is the um, web address to that. So from here, I'll actually kind of talk about, we'll do a little demo, but again, I'll talk about how we base this on what we learned. So um, this is actually what we um, published, what you'll see if you go on our website now on that um, in collections. And so this is how we learn from, um, from what, talking to people. Again, you'll see that there's the bar chart here. Um, we, as I mentioned, changed from those themes because those were up to a little interpretation. So two more production technique. Of course, everything in art history is up for is up for discussion, um, but it's much less, uh, it's much more solid that something is a drawing or something is an oil painting. So we really leaned into that, um, really allowed agency. So allowing click on and click off and um, zoom in. And so I'm actually going to show a little bit of this, um, the thumbnails. So when someone hovers over, um, you could actually get a little sense for what you're going to see. So this is going to what people told us is that they needed to see a preview, but also prove it so that like they could see how we made these decisions. So they can see the work so they can click and then actually pass through to um, the collections object to see the actual information around that. This is getting to agency that I can choose what I'm looking at over here by clicking on things. And this is just fascinating. So you can really get a sense for when different kinds of production. So when was she drawing? When was she making oil paintings? And zooming in so that we can kind of give a closer date range. And that can be done up there with the, with the um, text or by just zooming. And then again, so that, so that we can help people use this in their own workflows, having this download button so that you know, regardless how I um, how I zoomed in or what I selected to look at, that um, that I can then download that and use that in a presentation and that kind of thing. So that is a super quick presentation. Uh, that is a super quick look at the data visualization. And while this is up, I'll just talk about this has been up. Um, I think I'm not sure. Maybe almost a year, perhaps now. And some of the responses, we haven't done a formal study on the response, but what I've heard from researchers and educators and artists um, is the stories that I've heard is that, A, some people did not realize the full breadth of the work that um, George O'Keefe did, particularly if you look at glassware or um, cast sculptures or stoneware. So that's been a um, key learning that has come up or an insight that people have been exposed to. Um, the other thing that I've heard is that it really helps seeing the trends in terms of when um, when drawing was happening, when was when paintings were happening, and then those years where perhaps nothing was happening. And it really inspires a closer look at her biography. And so I think in the future, we've already looked at how do we also add points of biography within here. Um, and another thing that we've just seen is, again, that one, the access to the full catalog and being able to, if you're looking for something from 1953, really dive in and see what's there. And you can see things, not only if it's in the George O'Keefe collection, but if it's in the collection of the Art Institute and then click through to see the, um, the record at that museum 
or in a private collection and see what everything is looking like. So that has been really exciting. And I'll kind of wind up um, with um, what that means in terms of our next steps. And our next steps are really, um, again, learning more about this. And as we publish, as we look at the catalog resume and we're really working on publishing that in a more fully um, full format, but thinking about how data visualization per page can help people um, still have that fluidity and a serendipity of discovery. So think about that on an uh, artwork, uh, artwork basis. Uh, as I mentioned, I think that uh, we saw a lot of interest in that more drill down bubble chart. And so that's exciting. Um, I think that we could think about um, this same kind of bar chart in terms of exhibitions, which we have that data. So when were the big exhibitions? How big were they? Um, so that could be an exciting data visualization. And as I mentioned earlier, I really would love for us to think about more, um, more data storytelling and how we link these together. So um, yeah, so that's really what we've been up to. And I know it's a really quick overview of what we've been thinking about, how we approached it, and, um, and um, what we really want to um, see with this more. And I can demonstrate more, or I want to kind of open it to um, what questions are, or, um, or I can demonstrate more. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. That it was so interesting. And it really just you know, obviously scratches the surface of all of the work that you and other people are doing to make this information about Georgia O'Keeffe's work and her life and legacy accessible in these really interesting ways. Um, we have lots of questions. Um, Good as usual. Um, I talked really fast. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's great. And um a few of these questions you addressed in your talk, but um, one good question from Cheryl is she had a question about your focus groups and she wondered how you decided who got to be a part of those focus groups um, and how other people might be able to be involved in future opportunities to give feedback for this project. Wonderful. Well, that's a great question. Um, so I think what we started with and I um, really what what my philosophy on these things is that when we start with something, and, and in some ways this is a bit of an experiment because uh, really no one was knocking on our doors saying, well, except for me, no one was really knocking the door saying, I need a data visualization. <laughs> um, so um, what we wanted to do first is because we were looking at the catalog resume and thinking about, well, who's the um, main uh, first audience for this catalog? And so a first audience, uh, primary audience, not to say that other audiences aren't important, um, are the researchers and curators are, who are coming to our um, site who are using the catalog resume to um, write books, to develop exhibitions, um, that kind of thing. Because that's that is a key um, a key audience for our research um, services that we do here. And so to get started, um, one thing we want to do is build something you know, that actually meets the needs of at least one um, group of people and um, hopefully then expand it out so that it actually um, meets more needs for more people. But if you don't think or ask a certain people, it can be all over the place and um, can't be targeted. So for this first round, we um, designed the focus groups of people who had the last few years kind of interface with our research collections, who had asked questions, were actively working on projects. So people who had um, recently done an exhibition, so they had been using our resources, trying to get access to our images, um, people who had recently written books on this, or people who worked at, um, uh, worked at museums who had O'Keeffe's in their collections. So that's what we started with. Um, but now I think it's also um, clear, and what I've really loved is Molly's helped share 
um, other uses when artists educators are using this and everything. So I think now really um, looking at what broader needs. So um, my email address is on the website. And so if you're interested in being a future tester, please email me and we'll put you on on a list because I think that what we really did from the beginning is really target it because the world of possibilities was this big and what we wanted to get started was this big. Um, but we've seen that this is actually more useful than for people beyond just a curator. And so um, now as we move forward, we want to even we want to think about visualization and the catalog, the full breadth of her work. How could that be more useful to a broad audience as well? Great. That's that's wonderful. And especially that there will be future opportunities for folks who are here today to give their feedback and how they might be using such a tool um, to explore O'Keeffe's life and legacy. Um, we have a request for um, a couple more demonstrations of the visualization. Um, and Carla suggests, could we please drill down into the year 1952, which was the year she was born, to give us a sense of how one could use the visualization by year. All right, let me um, bring this up. Let me get you off the screen so I can see here. Right. Portion of screen. Right. So you should be able to see, oh, well, not seeing the bottom, let me hear using very, very fancy techniques here, uh, trying to, there we go. Okay, 1952 is our year. Oh, okay. Do you see, uh, see the visualization here? All right, so we're gonna look at, uh, we're gonna come on the timeline here. Looks like 1952 was not a, well, 1952 was, um, not the biggest year. It looks like we have a lot more drawings. Um, so we've got a set of oil paintings and a set of drawings. So what we what, what we can do here, and we, we can actually even zoom in here, 1952 uh, to 1952. So just showing some different ways that we can go. I can find it. That's not as uh, visually appealing to me. So I can um, zoom out a little bit. Um, I can zoom in and get a closer look because there isn't a number on that. So let me look here. So um, here I have um, 19 drawings and I have 12 oil paintings. Let's look at those oil paintings. So it looks like a lot of them are in, um, or some of them are in our collection. So we can kind of really get a sense for what O'Keefe is doing here, right? She is um, uh, has a few here from um, that are clearly from, Abiquiu and the Ghost Ranch area, um, but uh, you know some other close-ups and things like this. So we have this oil painting that's uh, currently at the McNay. Then we have a few beautiful pieces that are in our collection. One of them, Mesa and Rodis. So I believe this is from her bedroom window um, with the cottonwoods there. Um, so we can see that she did that twice. So she was really exploring that um, waterfall. So I guess we can really see what she was thinking in terms of painting in 1952, the year of your um, the year of your birth. Um, she was thinking a lot about trees here and the uh, environment around her in um, in Abiquiu and Ghost Ranch. Um, I'm actually not familiar with this work right here um, with the little flowers on the side. So that's an interesting uh, piece there. Um, it's also fun to look at see. Um, what are the drawings that she was looking at? So if I wanna see both of this, if I wanna see everything at the same time, um, let's see, I'm gonna to go to, well, let's see the drawings here. We are at 52, 53. Let's look at the drawings. And, oh, we have a few dogs here. <laughs> Interesting that um, the paintings didn't show up in this, but when she's sketching, We've got some beautiful dogs um, here. I hope everyone knows that um, George O'Keefe was a chow chow lover. So we've got some drawings of dogs. We've, those are in our collection. We can see again, the trees and some antelope horns that she's really looking at. And so some of these explorations of the tree, 
And uh, here, the expl um, exploration of that, um, the paintings that we saw. So um, it's really cool to see um, timelines and how they kind of go together of what's working at. And from this, we can go to the collections online record. So then someone can further explore this piece, can see more clearly what's going on with this piece. Um, like we um, like we can with the full. So I think that's also something that we really want to point out is that this is not a set. This is not separate from the collections. This is really linked to every. This is linked to the full record, so someone can see everything about this and even then get into more of the relationships and how this is related to archival objects and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, that's um, that's what 1952 looks like. Um, some other ways that we can really explore is if you if you're interested in like glassware, what the heck is a what the heck is glassware? And then we see that well, there's only one glassware. <laughs> but one gets this thing. Um, and it was uh, in 1938. And uh, we can view this work. And this is a design that actually um, with the Jimson weed image that she did in in collaboration with um, Steuben. Um, and so we get a sense for what that is. Um, the stoneware is obviously um, something when she was getting into pottery later in life. So we see this is later in life um, as she um, gets into pottery with Juan Hamilton, but also because her eyesight is failing. So it's something um, tangible. I'm sure many people out there um, can dive into that story more um, deeply. Um, but also um, how these pastels are very much part of their earlier career. And I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, pastels, but we can really see how um, I just love her works in pastels and we can get a closer look at them. Um, and again, we have the works that are not only in our collection, um, this is gonna um, take a second to go out here, but also in these other collections um, so that we can get a look at them. And if we have a link, we can actually um, view the works. This should hopefully, this one has a link. So if we have a link to it, we can actually view it in the current collection. And I'm actually going out to the Minneapolis and I'm seeing what they have to say. So we're really trying to interlink these kinds of things, allow exploration, but also, um, but also let it be that um, you can do a deep dive on that work. Um, any other requests for that? I also have a reset. I can down, I can download the image of that, but always just see um, what's in here. So if I if I did nineteen, let's just do nineteen fifty two again. And it only brings up that year. And then if I view those works, it bring up everything that ever happened in 1952 below, regardless of what it is. So different ways of looking at things. Thank you so much for that demonstration. And thank you, Carla, for the suggestion. Um, it was really great to see the connection between the drawings and the paintings that were created in that year and how a tool like this can help you build those connections in your mind as you're doing research or exploring. Um, we do have a question just about um, how long did the process take to build this public facing tool um, from the idea to today? And a second part of that question is, what might you suggest for other institutions who are hoping to do the same thing um, with their collections? Yeah, um, I so um, we the the um, the actual feet on the ground running design phase and doing it. Let's say I would say that really a year with everything else going on because um, we don't focus on one thing at a time. So, but um, it was so it was a year interspersed with other things. But of course, really what happens is that this is based on years of getting our information together. So really, if we want to show all the works, that means we had to have all of the works written out. We had to have all of the dates written out. So we 
and in our systems in a way that could be readable. Um, we needed to have them, um, we needed to have the drawings tagged in a way, the oil paintings tagged in a way. So um, while the visualization itself took a year or less than a year, while, along with a lot of other projects, it's really about those uh, efforts over time of knowing how we want to look at our information. Um, so that that's that's years there. Um, and and that's something that I think anyone who does work in museums or works with collections, we're all thinking about that. And again, our registration departments and um, people who take care of our art have been doing that to a certain extent for as long as museums have been around. And now we're just thinking about this because um, we started our project of publishing our collections about five or six years ago and knew that this is the kind of thing we wanted to be doing. So that's why we used a um, we use standard protocols. We used a thing called uh, linked open data um, for those if we have some people out there um, using standards like uh, linked art, which is a target model for that um, that other museums are also using. So, um, so it's a really hard question to answer because even though once we started just working on the sketches, it's it's based on all of this work that people have been doing for a long time. But um, in terms of other places. Just, I think the biggest advice I would give is, well, what is your goal? Um, in our sense, because we have George O'Keefe, our goal was really to give a sense of that provocation of if we have a full data set, what can we, what can be learned, what insights can be learned by looking at it in this different way? So the first thing to think about is what goal are we trying to achieve? What do we, what, what and who would um, benefit from this and then talk to those people with those sketches. That's great advice. And I think your talk overall has inspired lots of people to dig more deeply into data visualization as a whole. Um, we have a couple questions about um, what advice you might give for folks who want to learn more about the field of data visualization, what kind of like training or education um, might go into having a better understanding of this, this growing, this growing field? Yeah, uh, that is a great question. Uh, depends how deep you want to get into it. I way I would start um, is um, the what, what how I keep up on things is that there's a visualization society and they have um, information is beautiful awards every year. And so this is really how I keep my finger on the pulse of what real professionals, this is, um, I'm a dabbler, I'm not an expert in data visualization. I know what I wanna do, um, but there are people out there that are doing really beautiful things. So um, if you um, do a search for information is beautiful awards, um, they have a data set that you can look at for 2023, you can see the winners in different categories. Uh, data visualization in, um, in, for social impact is huge. Um, for scientific kind of communication is huge, like looking at how the climate is changing or um, you know wealth distribution. So for some social impact, there's just a ton of really exciting um, examples, especially through the UN and, and things like that. But if you go to the Information is Beautiful Awards, um, they have a whole arts and culture category. And you can look at long lists, you can look at short lists of winners, um, you can look at the winners. Um, and um, many in that category, like you could also see what in, because pop culture is kind of in that category. So you'll see a ton of visualizations about Seinfeld and a ton about The Office, <laughs> Star Wars, um, movies. Um, but um, there are also ones that um, delve into art. And that's really where I kind of get my best examples from because there's a lot of things out there and it's nice to look through that. And um, uh, New York Times has, like I said, they're really a great um, at looking at data storytelling. So, um, and they've been doing a lot of um, graphs and visualizations along with um, storytelling for over a decade. So that's a really fun place to look. And even um, I didn't want to use an example because uh, because then it gets into other topics. But um, you know, a lot of voting and polling has a ton of great um, visualizations. So uh, regardless of what you think about politics, 
like how they use visualization is super interesting. So, um, so some of those sites have been really um, exciting as well. That's great. Thank you. Those are lots of great places to get started if you're among those in the in the audience who want some more um, ways to explore the field. Um, we've gotten several questions um, about the future of this project. So you're, you know, starting here um, and you've mentioned earlier in your talk that um, there are plenty of directions that this can go. Um, so we have folks who are interested in what data, data visualization might look like for O'Keefe in regard to describing her travels and also her her personal relationships, her networking um, with correspondence. Do you have any thoughts or um, possible ideas for visualizations that might address those pieces of her life in the future? Tons of ideas. And I love this, hearing what your ideas you have. Um, so actually, one of our first prototypes, um, uh, and I don't have it at hand, so it was, and this was back in 2018, one of our first prototypes with data visualization um, was on personal relationships. And it was interesting because um, we uh, looked at um, uh, we looked at something that tied over time because um, George O'Keefe, she had a long life. She knew a lot of people. And so we would kind of make, uh, we experimented with connecting people over time because there would be that maybe she had a lot of interaction with a person in the twenties and then went for decades where you don't have any evidence of interaction. And then in the fifties, maybe another spurt and things like that. And one of the things that we thought about a lot was, um, uh, you know, do we define what these relationships were? But her relationship changed with a lot of people. Like sometimes they were best friends. Sometimes they were a little bit of frenemies and things like that. So that became a little bit fraught. And I think we didn't take that to the next step because it was really tricky because you're basing it on, um, you're, you're basing it on an incomplete set of evidence. And so I can say this is a visualization of uh, O'Keefe's relationships over time, but that just means that based on the archival evidence that still that exists in the world right now. So, um, so you know, I think those incomplete set, sets of data are really tricky because you don't want to tell it, a story that's not the story because it's incomplete evidence because you know a set of letters is over here and I haven't looked at them. So, um, so I think that one's a little tricky. I think we could do it more, we know that she knew this person, we know that she knew that person, um, but I, I wonder how useful that, that will be um, because she lived so long and she knew so many people. So that could be more of a network diagram like MoMA has done something like that like um, before. Um, travels, I think is really interesting. We actually have a prototype and it actually might even be in the background on here of we wanted to show where O'Keefe was at different times. But O'Keefe moved around so darn much that if to do it and to do it accurately and to build the trust of everyone, it has to be accurate. We had to do it by three month periods. And so, because she would spend three months in New Mexico and two months in Hawaii and this there, and at least to start, <laughs> we did that. I'm like, it has to be three months. Oh my God, this is completely unreadable. So we, um, I think we have that information. And so maybe that would be more like, a, if you remember that graph from the Van Gogh, where it's actually a map and then shows like a movement over time. So I think people are very interested in that and then showing the artworks there. So um, it didn't fit in this format, but I would really like to see that. Um, or one question that we get asked in visitor services all the time in our museum is where's her artwork now? Um, so plotting, we know where it is because we have that information. Um, so plotting that on a map so that we can share with people because we have a lot of people that come from out of town and they might come from Chicago and they say, well, how can I see more O'Keefe in my hometown? Where can I go? Um, so I do think that's all that's out there. Um, are they... I guess the next question in the one minute is like, well, when is that all that happy happening? I think as we do publish the catalog resonate, we'll have to pick a few things that we can work into the overall project. And um, then this, you know, hopefully from there, we just 
find people that we can work with to continue uh, continue these efforts. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we are right at 10 o'clock, so that was the perfect timing. Um, and thank you to everyone who asked questions in the chat. Um, you will have an opportunity to stay posted. So if you visit our website um, after today's talk, we will send a follow-up email and we'll be sure to include um, how to access this data visualization so you can see how things progress um, and have plenty of time on your own to explore the features that are there. Um, we would definitely encourage you to do that. And as Liz said, if you have thoughts or feedback of how it's of use to you, we would love to hear that too. Um, so again, I just wanna take a moment to thank you so much, Liz, for being here today and for all of the work that you're doing to make this information put it within reach of of everybody uh everywhere so thank you again thank you and thanks to everyone out there i've really enjoyed being here okay we'll see you next time